everybody. I'm excited to bring you this interview with Harry, the rideshare guy, Campbell. It's Harry Unplugged coming up in just a minute. And today's episode is brought to you by our sponsor, the Fair for Uber car program. If you're tired of driving the car you're in right now and you want to try something new and different, check out the Fair for Uber car program. I used to drive a 2013 Toyota Prius. Then I started using the Fair program and I got a really clean and spacious Hyundai Elantra. has a fantastic stereo system for $195 per week plus taxes. Stairway to Heaven sounded really good. Now, that price includes everything. Rideshare insurance and unlimited miles. And since Fair partners with Uber, you can earn a very strong bonus for a relatively low number of trips. Now, this program is available in California for now, but there are other programs all across the country. So check the Fair website for the prices in your market. Download the Fair app and get a car today. It's a great program. And be sure to use our code, which is RSG100. So that's RSG100. So we get credit for sending you there. All right. All right, let's start this show, this interview with Harry, the Rideshare Guy, Campbell. Welcome to the Rideshare Dojo. If you're an Uber or Lyft driver or anyone in the gig economy, this is the place for you. With tips and techniques, interviews with passengers and industry leaders, entertainment, inspiration, motivation. Here, with over 23,000 rides, is your host, Jay Crater. Let's enter the dojo. Hey, everybody. Uber drivers, Lyft drivers, Instacart, Postmates, Ease, Zoom, Via, DoorDash, Amazon Prime. Let's see, what else? Caviar, uh, Uber eats all you drivers and passengers and all of us who are part of the gig economy i say welcome i'm jay crater this is my podcast welcome to the show let's enter the dojo all right i got a great one for you here uh my guest my business partner harry the ride share guy campbell uh harry unplugged in this uh this chat we talk about AB5, of course. What's the future of driverless cars? What does Harry think is going to happen with Uber and Lyft? Will they ever become profitable? Um, how are Uber and Lyft, are they going to be any different than taxi companies in the future? And then I ask him a good question. Where does he see himself in 10 years? Harry's a really bright guy. It's a pleasure to work with him. And it was really fun to uh, catch him before he headed off to Hawaii on his vacation. So ladies and gentlemen, Dojo Nation, Without any further ado, the almighty, the powerful, the wizardry of Mr. Harry, the rideshare guy, Campbell. Ready if you are. All right, let's do it. So uh, my guest in the dojo today, unplugged, Harry, the rideshare guy, Campbell, joining us. And Dojo Nation, we are in, we are very fortunate to get Harry before he heads off to Hawaii, and he gets all chill and relaxed. <laughs> so, Harry, welcome to the dojo. Thanks for having me, Jay. I like this warm up music. I feel like I'm getting ready to duel a rideshare legend uh, in his own <laughs> respect. So let's do this. <laughs> let's do this, yeah. So, I just wanted to bring you on. There's a lot of things happening, and I'm legitimately curious what you think. Um, so. Let's just start with what's what's on everybody's mind right now, which is uh, AB5, Assembly Bill 5. So on a Monday, on this, on this podcast, uh, we're presenting an episode with um, Rebecca Stack Martinez, who is a, mm-hmm. a, an organizer, and she really laid out a lot of information about um, AB5. And it seems like it could go a lot of different ways. I yeah. mean, overall, it's great. It's great that uh, something's happening. Uh, it's great that you know the government has said, "Wait a minute, you know something's not quite right here." It's uh, not really fair that some people are doing so well, and then there's those whole mass of drivers that aren't really getting fair, you know, labor treatment. Yeah. Um, so, so that's that's all very encouraging, and she really kind of opened my eyes to that fact. That you know, it's all it's all very positive that something's happening, but how do you think it's how do you Harry think it's going to shake out? What do you think is going to happen, say, over the next year as a result of this AB five? I'm just curious yeah. what your, what your opinion is because 
it can go a lot of different ways, but you know a lot of people and you've been in the industry for a while and uh, you have access. So what do you what do you think will happen? Do you think it's just going to stall? you think Uber and Lyft are just going to fight it in court? Do you think they'll actually make drivers uh, employees? Uh, do, what would that look like if that were to happen? What do you think? Yeah. Well, I'll... Uh... Where to start? All right, let's do this. So <laughs> to start knocking out answers to your questions, I would say, you know, first and foremost, I think it's pretty clear to myself and anyone who's followed Uber and Lyft closely that when they don't want something, they're going to basically put everything they have behind it to not let it happen. And they do not want drivers to be employees. To be honest, I I'm not 100% sure why that is. I mean, I get the basic reasons, you know, that it's more expensive and it changes their business model. But I feel like there are a lot of reasons behind the surface that we don't really know and we may never know unless we're working at Uber and at Lyft kind of in those closed door conversations. But I you, think you, if, so you don't but you, so you don't think it's just that it's going to cost them 30 percent more for the, the the expense of the drivers. I mean, I guess I guess that I mean, that's the most basic reason, but it just seems like a lot of you know, a very tough stand, you know, the, all the stances that they're taking and the rhetoric and everything that they're doing. I mean, it, it seems like it's got to be more about money. There must be something core to their business or, you know, some sort of greater feeling that I, I feel like if it was just a money issue, right? I mean, they're, the company's losing a billion dollars a quarter. What's another 300 million? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, or what's right. another few hundred million, right? So I, I feel like there has to be something a little bit more uh, than just, uh, you know, how much more it's going to cost them. Yeah. Yeah. I guess. I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think, uh, you know, they're under a microscope. They're not profitable. They have to become mm -hmm. profitable. And, and this is, you know, a 30% hit on, on that goal, get, you know, achieving yeah. that goal. Um, I mean, just, I mean, just in terms of human decency though, I mean, as a company, you think they'd want, you would think, you would think that they would want to have their their company and the people who are representing their company treated fairly and 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 we're obviously drivers are not uh, we're not we're not being treated like employees we're tr treated as we are kind of treated as employees uh, yeah. <laughs> but we're called we're called independent contractors and yeah. we don't have any control and it was interesting I did a, a whole podcast on that report you sent over uh, driving away our health about mm -hmm. How not having control over your income and having income go down causes stress, which causes your health to, yeah. to fail. And um, and then these drivers, who many of them don't even have health insurance because it's not part of you know being an mm -hmm. independent contractor. So, okay. Um, so then, what you think will happen is they're going to fight this. Uh, as they are. Yeah. They, they've, well, they, I think we're actually, not what I think is going to happen. What's already happening is that they are actively fighting this. So this, yeah. you know, AB5 passed in the Senate, still needs to be signed by the governor, but it sounds like that's pretty much a done deal. And come January 1st, 2020, drivers are technically going to be employees, but Uber and Lyft are now saying that, so what? <laughs> we don't think that uh, drivers are employees. We, you know, they're saying that they're a technology company and not a transportation company. So they don't need to classify their drivers as employees. And so I think now the onus is going to be shifted back on to either local city attorneys or certain or various, you know, kind of like legislative bodies in the government to go and enforce this, you know, most likely through a lawsuit. Uh, you know, have, they're basically going to have to sue Uber and Lyft. And I don't, I don't know if we need to get into all the details because there's a lot that could or may happen. But basically, I think that we're going to see a big legal battle or at least yep. that'll be one of the things we'll see. Well, just a little plug for, for the rideshare. Dojo podcast uh, next week or the week after. I'm I'm doing the interview this week uh, of an attorney who is filing a suit against Uber uh, for exactly this. The, yeah, a the, very famous attorney too in the in the rideshare world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm talking with her uh, uh, Thursday. Yeah, I think it's Thursday uh, afternoon. So that'll be a fascinating uh, listen. Okay, let's let's switch topics here. So driverless cars. So this is a question I, I can't really get a straight answer to. Driverless cars. So when these driverless cars, you know, become common day, mm -hmm. will, will they still need a driver? Will they still need somebody in there? Well, I think by the definition of driverless, there's no driver, right? <laughs> right. So, so, is, so, so these cars will actually get to the point where 
they there will there will be no need for like an operator like a bus has an operator yeah you know well i mean there's a little bit there's two sort of different approaches right now that certain companies are taking there's some that are more on the oem you know the the manufacturer side which is going to be like tesla and ford and all of these companies and they're sort of you know taking the slow and steady path where they want to get to like 99 percent of the functions can be done by the computer and then 99.5 and then you know so forth all the way to 100 percent but with companies like uber and lyft 99 9.99% doesn't do them much good because if there has to be any type of human in the car, it doesn't save them any money. If anything, it's more expensive because it's going to be a car with a bunch of technology that they're going to have to pay for and a driver. So they really need to get that driver out of the car, kind of as Travis Kalanick once famously said, they need to get the other dude out of the car before they can really... Um, you know, kind of like financially benefit from driverless cars. Right. All right. So that's where it's going. All right. So that's that. That answers my question. Okay. Another big question: What's going to happen with Uber and Lyft? So they're not profitable. Yeah. A- and and I, you know, I, I'm in San Francisco, so I, I I have people from you know J.P. Morgan. I got stock mm-hmm. people. I got all ca- people that you know studied these guys and. And there's no there's no real clear path to profitability. Um, I mean, obviously, if there was, they'd be they'd be you know working on it and, and, and yeah. getting it implemented. So, what do you think is going to happen? How how will they become profitable? If so, how? And will both companies survive? Will one eat the other? How do you, how do you see this playing out? Again, I'm yeah. just asking for your opinion based on you know. Sure. You, you being in the industry, but these are things I think about um, as I'm driving around. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think as far as profitability, that's been like the, you know, for a normal driver, profitability matters a lot. But as you've sort of seen with Uber and Lyft, profitability isn't necessarily the most important metric of success, right? I mean, Uber has been around forever and never made a profit. And if you ask someone on the street, if they're a successful company, I think most people would probably say yes, right? (laughs) Yet they've never made a dollar. So I think that it's easy to kind of look at profitability in a traditional sense, but I think we're kind of living in a world where profitability isn't necessarily the most important thing. If people believe in the company's vision and the company's narrative, then profitability isn't as important. But if you look at Uber and Lyft stock price, I think a lot of people aren't really that confident in their vision. You know, they're sort of saying that, hey, you know what? Um, you can say that you don't, you're not going to be profitable for a while, but we want to s- start seeing you be profitable. And I think that profitability is actually pretty simple in the rideshare industry there's only two places that money comes from passengers you know they can charge passengers for rides and they pay drivers um, a percentage for doing the ride so they really either have to increase fares on passengers or pay drivers less than what they're already paying and so i think that some combination of that through uh you know also reducing costs like they just laid off three or four hundred people i think you know that's not going to move the needle a ton when you're losing a billion dollars a quarter but a lot of those actions over time and slowly raising prices on riders and, um, you know, paying drivers a little bit less is probably, you know, their only path to profitability. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, yeah, I think profitability is more important than, than, than you just stated it. I, I mean, Amazon, you know, when Amazon, uh, went public, they weren't making any money, but people could see, okay, you know, it's going to happen. Um, well, I don't know if people could see that it was going to happen, but that was the vision that the company was putting forward, right? And right. I mean, right. money I, is fungible. Stock prices are fungible. I mean, that's the one thing I, I, I know is that I'm no expert in mm-hmm. <laughs> stock, you know, stock price. I think I think the stats show that no one's really an expert in picking stocks. So, uh, you know, sort of judging the company based off of their profitability is is is, is a tough job, I would say. Right, 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 right. There's You're, you're right. There's definitely... This thing that's happened where it's not so much based on dollars and cents, but companies yeah, putting out a vision, yeah. these, and these I mean, disruptive companies about, putting out a vision, yeah, that they're like right. creating like a whole new... It, right? A lot of people have made money so far with Uber and Lyft. You know, a lot of the, all of the early investors, a lot of the early employees have all cashed out and sold stock already, or when they can sell stock, they bought at such a low price, even though it's down 30, 40%, they'll still make money. A lot of drivers over time have made a lot of money, um, you know, respectively. Uh, people like me have worked with Uber and Lyft and made money, right? So 
there's a lot of people that have definitely, uh, I guess you would say, made money or benefited, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. Um, and and but that's been on the backs of you know <laughs> of the drivers and and the venture capital companies, you know, yeah. who, who are supplementing it. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I, I guess at the end of the day, the numbers all, you know, there are definitely winners and losers for sure. Yeah. Yep. Uh, well, that's, well, that's what this, that's what um, this, the woman I spoke to, Rebecca was saying, you know, with AB5 mm -hmm. is, you know, it, it, it harkens back to the time where people unionized, you know, where yeah. people were working in factories and, and, and conditions were terrible. And people got together and they said, no, you know, we need to have some rights here. We need to be able to, you know, come together and speak as a group and, and have some, some kind of control over our lives because the conditions just are not tenable anymore. And, and that's what AB5, at least is the beginning of, it's kind of a harbinger of some, yeah. of some future where drivers, I mean, cause it's a, it's a big group of people, you know, and it's not just drivers, you know, it's, it's yeah. independent contractors and in all kinds of industries are going to be impacted by this. So yeah. it's, it's a big deal. Definitely. And I mean, I think specifically with AB5, you know, you obviously have a lot of the drivers who've been very vocal and, you know, I've interviewed Nicole Moore from Rideshare Drivers United on my podcast and, you know, you're interviewing Rebecca from Gig Workers Rising. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely, you know, I think that the uh, the ones in favor for a lot of the reasons you mentioned are very vocal and I think that they have a right, you know, they should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, th I think that, you know, for all the reasons you allude to, the one thing I think that's been a little missing from the conversation is a lot of the drivers who may not necessarily be worse off by becoming employees, but they're scared that they would be worse off, right? They're right. scared that they'll lose some of the flexibility or that, you know, even that connotation of employee union, right? Like a lot of people mm -hmm. like uh, you know, for all it's, you know, there's obviously plenty of negatives about driving for Uber and Lyft, but there are a lot of positives. And I think it has to do with that flexibility. There's nothing in the text of AB5 that says drivers will lose that flexibility. But if you've worked any other job as an employee, you know, nothing really comes close to driving uh, Uber and Lyft as far as when and where you can drive, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it basically will come down as it often does to money. I mean, if drivers can, can make 30% more, for example, you know, I think most drivers would be for that. And yeah, and even giving up a little bit of flexibility for sure. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So are Uber and Lyft going to be any different than taxi companies? That's what I keep I, thinking I sort because, because, fly, oh, yeah, fly, what are you going to say? Well, no, I just like Flywheel. Flywheel's, a, yeah. you know, they've got an app. I drove for them for, a, you know, last year for a week. Mm -hmm. The, you know, you get the ping, you go pick up the person. The the in in San Francisco the taxis are maybe fifty percent more expensive than Uber and Lyft, which are subsidized yeah. by venture capital. So if you take that venture capital out of the out of consideration, and you bump up the price for Uber and Lyft, uh, what's the difference? There's not much difference other than the taxis are a little more regulated and a little more insurance on the car and you know, passengers feel a little more comfortable because their, their drivers, their taxi drivers have gone through a little bit more training. Um, it's hard to see what the difference it's because uh, it, I've seen somebody say that Uber Lyft are just becoming a different kind of a taxi company. And yeah, and it, well, I would say that, you know, one of the sort of theories or trends that I've seen is that I do think the rideshare industry is really coming full circle to the taxi industry. One of the kind of ironic things is, you know, when rideshare first burst onto the scene, their biggest detractors were the taxi companies. And it was kind of a, you know, it was, it was almost a laughable argument. You had all these taxi companies that traditionally have been hated by consumers telling everyone, hey, you know, you should regulate Uber and Lyft to be more like us. And consumers are thinking, huh, we love Uber. Why would we want, you know, why would we want anything to be uh, like taxis? But I think what we're sort of now seeing is, you know, in New York City, for example, a lot of the taxi drivers and rideshare drivers are kind of on the same side, you know, with a lot of these issues, Uber and Lyft drivers have seen their pay cut over the years, and they're facing a lot of the challenges that taxi drivers, so it, it seems like they're sort of more in common. And even when you look to the actual product of Uber and Lyft back in the day, you used to be able to just, uh, as a rider, you know, you, you didn't even have to enter a destination, you just got in the car and tell them where you want to go, everything was nice and seamless. And mm -hmm. now, when you look at the pay structure, and there's 
waiting time. And, you know, it's very com- the Uber and Lyft still quote an upfront price to the passenger. But on the back end with the driver, there's all these different fees and waiting time and, you know, new pay structures. And a lot of it is kind of similar to like the old school taxi pricing. Like, hey, if you've got an extra person, you know, mm-hmm. if you're going to the airport, we charge you 50 cents extra or a buck 50 extra. Right. It's because basically what's happening is when drivers are doing more work, they need to be paid for it. And that's kind of really what the essence of uh, tax, you know, some of the issues with taxi were. And I think in some respects, Uber and Lyft are sort of solving some of that through technology. But uh, it definitely does seem like uh, well, I think it's. Well, look, in San Francisco, where all this started, the problem with the taxis was th- there wasn't enough of them. Mm-hmm. So because there weren't enough of them, they were in high demand. Yeah. And since they were in high demand, taxi drivers, for many of them were just assholes. They were just very picky. And, right. you know, if you if you were out, you know, in the Richmond district, yeah, good, good luck getting a taxi. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, the real trick that Uber and Lyft, you know, foisted upon us was that there's like an unlimited number of cars. Yeah. So, so it brought in a whole bunch of people who said, well, this is great because I can always get a ride whenever I want. So in mm-hmm. some ways, the taxi industry was just hamstrung by regulations and by, you know, there was, yeah. they could I they, mean, a they, lot of that, though, I think was self-inflicted. You know, they weren't exactly, you know, these guys all knew that, especially the owners, you know, I think knew they were doing very well with the yeah. current system and the medallion values rising and they weren't exactly looking to disrupt themselves. Where I think Uber and Lyft have taken almost, you know, to credit them, they've taken an opposite approach when you look at scooters, for example, and all of the data they saw that, hey, you know, that we, there's actually a, another mode that we don't want all these scooters and e-bike companies to come in and take all of our short Uber trips. We need to get in on this and kind of disrupt ourselves. So it's definitely a different yeah. uh, line of thinking, you know, at a corporate level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely more progressive. All right. I'm going to ask you just uh, one one or two more questions. I, I didn't want right. this to be a super long, long chat. I just wanted to kind of hit some bullet points here with you. Um, and I'm really curious to ask you this, Harry. Where do you see yourself in 10 years? What's, what's, your, what's your long-term vision? Because I've... For for those of you who are out there in Dojo Nation, I contacted Harry about I don't know, it was like two two and a half years ago. I was in in Bali, and I sent him an email and I said, you know what, I'm a writer and I've been driving for a while and let's uh, maybe I could you know write some articles. And Harry's first question was, how many could you do per month? And I, I said, I don't know, like four. And he said, okay, that's good. Okay, we can you know <laughs> let's let's start to work together. And then that turned in it does sound like me. <laughs> yeah. And then so then that that turned into, okay, write an article, then you can make a video too. So then I was doing articles and videos. And then sometime a year ago I started talking about a podcast and that finally materialized and we're partners in that. So Harry and I have been working together for two years. And I gotta say, Harry, I'm very impressed at how you have built this uh monolith, this uh, you know, the rideshare guy. I mean, every article I seem to read says, uh, you know, has a quote from you. So they all go to you first to ask you what you think. And you've got, you know, a handful of great, you know, people contributing content. And you got all these, you know, insurance companies working, um, you know, you get, it's pretty impressive what you've put, what you've put together and created for yourself, a very nice lifestyle. And, um, you know, you're right, you're right in the mix. Yeah, so you know, I appreciate that, and obviously, uh, wouldn't be able to do it without uh, guys like yourself. I think we've got a pretty good uh, partnership working together with yeah. all of the content we're doing. Yeah, so absolutely. But so so, given that I respect your you know yeah. your capabilities mm-hmm. and and your foresight, you obviously saw this thing coming and you jumped on it. Um, where do you see yourself in ten years? I, d- I don't see you just running the rideshare guy. <laughs> do, do you see yourself, you know, living where you're still living? Do you, um, do you see yourself branching out into some other areas? Uh, do you see yourself retired? Do you see yourself playing the stock market? I don't know. Yeah. Where do you see yeah. yourself? I mean, 10 years is definitely a long time away. And right? I know, especially yeah. when you're working in an online business, which is basically what I'm doing. I have an online business. Uh, I think it's even more tenuous. 10 years is even more tenuous than if you were to have brick and mortar, just because there's so many, you know, you have that ability to scale so quickly, but can also be taken away at any time. So right. definitely 
definitely, you know, you mentioned all the media mentions. That's probably like a good example of I'm really trying to strike while the iron is hot and take advantage of everything that we've built. But I suspect that, you know, to answer your question in 10 years, if I had to take a guess, I think I will be doing something. I, I, I think I may still be running the rideshare guy, but the rideshare guy may be a very different form. <laughs> it mm-hmm. could be, you know, only a YouTube channel in the future, or it could be, uh, you know, only a blog. I don't know exactly what it would look like, but we definitely are branching off into a lot of different areas. One of the things I'm personally interested in right now in these days is kind of running the business of the rideshare guy, but also the intersection of rideshare and all of these other industries. I'm not an expert in micromobility, autonomous vehicles, public policy, any of these things, but Rideshare is a huge component of a lot of these tangential mobility areas or even just, you know, like how cities operate type Mm -hmm. uh, policies and things like that. And so I sort of want to be there at that intersection, connecting people, educating people, providing the point of view of drivers. For example, if cities are going out and making policies that are going to affect how we're how we're driving and where we can pick up and not pick up. I want to make sure that they're talking to a bunch of drivers who know their shit. Right. I don't want the, uh, you know, a bunch of people in a in a room, uh, you know, looking at a PowerPoint and making decisions. I want some actual drivers in there. And so that's sort of what one of my, uh, you know, I I suspect that it'll have something to do with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, well, it's a huge industry, isn't it? Moving people from point A to point B, you know? Yeah, you'd be surprised. It it sounds simple. (laughs) Well, interesting, the, um, one of the articles I wrote uh, showed statistics for the percentage of uh, rideshare uh, traffic compared yeah. to uh, other forms of transportation, and the highest percentage was in San- the city of San Francisco, mm-hmm. and that was thirteen percent. So thirteen percent of all the rides in the city of San Francisco were rideshare. The other eighty-seven percent were you know personal vehicles and yeah. and commercial vehicles, and virtually everywhere else in the country, these you know these other there were five other markets uh, was like three percent. Mm-hmm. So it's it's a re- remarkably small percentage still, you know. So yeah. so that just shows you how much growth is is possible there. Um, but and then you got your you know public transportation, which in other countries is you know s- so much, much more better. successful. <laughs> yeah, better. I mean, I I, re- I still remember being in Copenhagen and being on the, on the train, and you know, there's like this whole section where people are very quiet. And the wealthy yeah. and the not so wealthy, the everybody everybody took the train. It was just what you did, and there was no social stigma about it. Same in Kuala Lumpur, same in, nice. in Singapore. You know, it's uh, it's quite a bit different than than the way we do it here. So there's lots there's lots of room for improvement, and, and there's going to be lots of things happening. So that's where you see yourself kind of at the forefront of this whole transportation industry. Yeah, I think for me, it's just kind of figuring out about where we can provide value, where we can help people and where we can make money because I am running a business after all. So those are sort of the three things that I try to align in any project partnership uh, that I'm taking on. And I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to find something, but I am not sure what it will look like. (laughs) Right. Yeah. It's very hard to predict. Yeah. All right. So I ask, uh, since I interviewed you the first time, I ask you uh, one last question. So Harry, the rideshare guy Campbell, walks into the room. What is Harry's theme song? What's playing? What do you want to have playing? What's my theme song? I think uh, I would like some uh, Tropical House. You know that that genre, Tropical House? It's kind of like upbeat, Tropical House techno type music, (laughs) but chill. (laughs) Yeah, something like this. This is a song. Yes, yeah, this is the Tropical House uh, uh, playlist on, sh- on, yeah, uh, on this Spotify. Yeah, actually exactly like the type of song I would walk into. You know, I'm kind of relaxed, chill, nothing too intense. That's kind of the type I. I went to a conference last week, and you know, one of the days I wore a Hawaiian shirt. That's sort of the type of guy I am. And and you're heading off to Hawaii, so you'll be able to get some real authentic uh, Hawaiian shirts. Heading off to Hawaii. I'll, I'll be working a little though. I'm gonna be working halftime. So yeah. <laughs> All right, Harry Campbell. Thank you so much for entering the dojo. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to? Uh, well, this is your audience too. Any last words you want to say to all the uh, Uber and Lyft and Amazon Prime and Via and 
and DoorDash and Caviar and all those drivers out there. Everyone out there working gigs. No, I think just uh, appreciate what everyone out there is doing. I know sometimes it can be a bit of a thankless job. So, you know, we, you know, Jay and I both appreciate and just say thank you to everyone who supports us, but also for the the gigs and the jobs that they're doing out there. And, you know, we're here to help, uh, you know, basically make you more money and be more happy and uh, be more satisfied with everything that you're doing. See what we can do. Yeah. I actually just love drivers. I mean, we're all entrepreneurs. We're all, you know, revolutionaries yeah. out there trying to you know, make things we're all happen. on the same side, right? Yeah. 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 And a lot of people working on their plan Bs, you know, it's, it's, yep. uh, it's, uh, it's great. It's great. We're alive and doing things out in the world. So here, here, Dojo Nation, drivers unite. All right. Harry Campbell, thank you so much. It's great having you on. Thanks, Ray. All right, all right, all right. Thank you, Mr. Harry Campbell. That was great. Thank you for your time. It was uh, great to get your insights into some of these big issues that we drivers are facing. And if you are a driver and you want to make more money driving in San Francisco, be sure to check out my website at rideshareDojo.com. And click on the master course link. I've got 50 videos which uh, aren't available on YouTube to teach you how to make more money in less time. If you're thinking about starting an online business, check out my free ebook called What's Next. It's available at nomadj.com. All right, that's a free download. I also do a daily one minute per day podcast called Nomad Daily with Jay Crater, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. So I listen to mine on my uh, iPhone. And every day it just loads up the new one and I just click on it and I listen to it for a minute, a minute and a half. And uh, people are really digging the content and the format. So check it out and subscribe. That would be great. Next episode, more news, interviews, all things Rideshare Dojo for drivers and all of us in the gig economy. As always, I'll do my best to bring you the best here in the dojo. This is Jay Crater. Thanks for entering the dojo every Monday and Thursday. I will be here every Monday and Thursday for you, the drivers. Drive happy and be safe out there. Loved this episode of the Rideshare Dojo podcast? Head over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. It really helps and it's very much appreciated. Be sure to visit RideshareDojo.com to join the conversation, access the show notes, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Thanks for listening, and be safe out there.